Um, general concepts are important. Oral health is one of them, which seems to be going through all the themes as well, aged care, veterinary, human health, etc. Um, and we're privileged now to have uh, Martin Batstone come speak with us. Uh, he said he was the only surgeon on the uh, agenda, um, but we always make sure there's a surgeon on the agenda. So um, we are very grateful and take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, it's not common that, well, actually, it is common that white males complain about being a minority. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not angry, though, you'd be pleased to know. And uh, as, a, as a surgeon, if you question me too much on microbiology or pharmacology, I'll fall apart very quickly, but I do have photos of pus. <laughs> so this is, uh, I'm going to present actually some data that we've been working on. And really, this talk is a, a game of two halves, to borrow a football analogy. Uh, we've done some, some work on antibiotics in fractures of the midface uh, and antibiotics in odontogenic infection, so a real uh, oral focus. And I think to give you the executive summary before I start, one is a, one is a uh, syndrome of antibiotic overuse and the second really is a syndrome of antibiotic over-reliance, which is not quite the same thing. So what about fractures of the midface? Uh, these are pretty common, believe it or not. Many of you might not have been exposed to them unless you've been out uh, night clubbing. But what we're talking about really are fractures of the zygoma, nose, uh, and fractures that involve the sinuses. So you can see on these photos that there is essentially broken bones, compound fractures into the sinus cavities, which as we all know are colonized by bacteria, not necessarily pathogens. So the standard advice given out by our team to uh, practitioners who see these patients in emergency departments are don't blow your nose. Uh, that's for mechanical reasons. So if you blow your nose with a sinus fracture, you will blow air into your soft tissue. Don't fly for pressure effects. Uh, review in the outpatients to organize what we consider semi-elective semi surgery. So generally within a week of the injury, uh, not all of these require surgery, but a proportion do. And most of them will get oral antibiotics to cover sinus pathogens uh, for a week prior to their surgery, or if they don't have surgery prior to non-operative management. And augmentin duofort is the most common, but not exclusively used antibiotic. And this is why we do that. So this patient was punched in the face in Noosa of all places, uh, blew his nose, didn't actually know he had a break, turned up to hospital a week later with a proptosed uh, eye, post-septal cellulitis, reduced vision, reduced eye movement. So this is orbital cellulitis, uh, a vision, certainly a vision threatening infection and potentially a life threatening infection. This is the reason that most people with fractures of the mid face and people are looking horrified. Don't worry, uh, it did get better. But this is why people with fractures of the mid face get given antibiotics after their injury before they get seen by us. So we were interested in what actually happens, how many people were getting antibiotics, how many people were getting infections, uh, and what should we, what are the sort of predictors of infection, I guess, for mid-face fractures. So we did a 24-month antibiotic prescribing analysis between two sites in Queensland, the Royal Brisbane Hospital here and Townsville Hospital. Uh, I won't read those out. They're not sort of controversial things that we looked at in all of these patients to try and work out what were the predictors of infection. And there was no intervention plan. We did discuss this study before we started and said, oh, we should do a randomized control trial. We'll randomize people to have antibiotics or not have antibiotics. And you'd all agree that would be the best way to do it. But the logistics of doing that on Friday night when you're getting a phone call from Emerald Hospital about transferring consent forms and recruiting patients to studies is almost impossible. So we thought, let's just see what's happening. Uh, and we didn't, so we didn't plan an intervention, but we'd already done a literature review in this hospital and was transitioning towards not giving people prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge Joel Tuckett, who's the primary author on this study, Gary Briley, Jason Tong, who helped collect the data, and uh, Kelly, who's done the statistical analysis. So there are a lot of patients. Over a two year period, nearly 1,400 people had fractures of the mid face. Uh, none of these are kind of surprises. Most of them are male, but not exclusively. Immunocompromise is rare. Uh, the smoking rate, if you're not aware, in Australia actually is the lowest in the developed world. It's probably in the low teens, so more smokers than, than the general population, but not particularly high. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients were also overrepresented. That's an orbital fracture rather than a maxillary fracture. So 
probably half of them received prophylactic antibiotics. So 700 prescriptions over the two year period were given to patients, uh, about half did not. And these are the sort of predictors of who got antibiotics. So males were more likely to get it, smokers, Townsville patients, and that's not a poor reflection on Townsville, it's just a reality of the fact that we were changing here towards not giving antibiotics, so more of them were getting given there. They weren't doing anything wrong, they were just continuing what we'd been doing for a long period of time. So they were all statistically significant predictors of antibiotic prescription. Uh, so we know the numerator, sorry, the denominator, which is nearly 1,400 patients. So we thought, oh, let's do a multi-varied uh, analysis. We'll find out what predicts infection, working out, of course, whether or not prophylactic antibiotics prevented infection, whether the fracture site was important, your cheekbone, your nose, your eye socket, whether you're immunosuppressed, gender, smoking status, and uh, whether or not you're an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And for better or for worse, that failed because we had three infections in nearly 1,500 or 1,400 patients. Uh, so you can't do a multivariate analysis on three events. <laughs> and for those of you who would look at a kaplan meier curve, it's quite boring. It just goes like that. Um, so, and the other thing to say is that none of them were orbital cellulitis, that photo that I showed you before. Uh, there was purulent exudate of the wound edge and two plate infections in people who had operations. And you can see here, so this is the... Uh, <laughs> post-injury antibiotics. So these are the ones we're actually looking at. Did you have antibiotics after your injury, before treatment, if you had treatment? All of these people had treatment that ended up having an infection, but we also collected data on perioperative antibiotics and post-operative antibiotics. And of course, uh, with one patient in the yes prophylactic antibiotic and no patient, uh, sorry, two in the no prophylactic antibiotic patient group, there is no difference between the groups either. So that's a, you know, really a good news story. Although our multivariate analysis failed, we can fairly confidently say that antibiotics are not required post-injury pre-treatment. And in fact, I'll show you this person again, because I've been working here for 11 years. Um, probably, you know, if you believe that data, we see three to 400 patients with mid-facial fractures per year. And that is the only person I've ever seen with orbital cellulitis, which is why I ran to my filing cabinet and got my camera. So I don't need to take a photo because I've never seen this before. So that is extremely rare. Uh, so where do we go to from here? Well, it's, this is probably the, of the first part of my two analogies, probably the easiest one to control for a couple of reasons. One is that most of these patients are a defined group. They come to a defined health service, usually a public hospital, not exclusively, and they get seen by a defined group of people. So oral and maxillofacial surgeons get phone calls uh, and we all know each other. We're a small specialty, there's probably about 20 or 30 people in the state that manage this. So we can say, look, we've done this study. This is what the scenario is. We don't need to give these people antibiotics anymore. Uh, so we can do that. We've already done the care pathway here at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, which is about referral and where people end up for their outpatient review. But part of that care pathway is they do not need antibiotics unless they have, you know, a obvious infection at the time of injury. Uh, and then of course we monitor infection rates through audit. So we see after that change, whether or not, if we get a sudden spike in orbital cellulitis, then maybe we've done the wrong thing, but I suspect that that won't be the case. So I'll go on to the second part of my talk, which is about odontogenic uh, infections. I know there are people with dental training uh, in the audience, but I'm gonna give you a very quick lesson that most dental caries is, if not bacterially caused, then bacterially mediated. And of course, it's a balance between bacteria, your saliva and your diet. Uh, causes destruction of the tooth structure, so enamel, dentine, and then eventually it will get into the pulp, which is the, I don't wanna say living, it's all living, but the part of your tooth with a blood supply, uh, and then it can become inflamed and eventually necrotic and infected, then the bacteria get into the bone. Uh, then you have a dental abscess, and of course the vets know about that as well. That's an intrabony abscess, and then you'll see on my next slide what can happen after that. But the vast majority are from oral flora, as you would expect, because that's what you have in your mouth, that's what causes dental caries. Uh, most of them are gram positive cocci or strep, uh, some anaerobes and the longer these dental abscesses go on, the more likely you are to have polymicrobial infection and they're sensitive to penicillin and metrazinazole or clindamycin. So it is extremely rare to have uh, non-oral flora like Pseudomonas, for example, or even staph uh, 
in dental abscesses other than in hospital patients, the immunosuppressed uh, or people who've had previous surgery, so broken jaws. But they can become a very big problem. I uh, looked in the, apparently the sixth most common cause of death in London in 1850 was a dental abscess. Uh, and they can get into, this is the sort of first step. So you have pus in the bone and it can drain into the mouth, which is less of a problem. That again is into the mouth and it's when it gets into the neck that people can get into big strife in terms of airway uh, or compromise. But like all abscess cavities, antibiotics are fairly ineffective on all the bacteria that are living in there in that soup. So they don't work particularly well, but the bacteria themselves are not particularly virulent or resistant. And we've got some uh, data to prove that to you if you don't believe me. So we're not talking about MRSA most of the time or ESBL or VRE. We're talking about strep milleri uh, and anaerobes. For those of you who haven't seen what a dental abscess looks like on an x-ray, there's about four on this. I don't know whether it presents too well, but that's an intrabony abscess there. So a dark space around the tooth root usually means there's bone destruction adjacent to the root of the tooth. And there's about another three here. There's one there, one on the top. That carries into the tooth. And if you look really closely, you can see widening of the periodontal ligament. This is not the only talk today on dental infection uh, Prof Marshall is going to talk about periodontal infection, and I won't steal his thunder by telling you that that's an infection on the periodontium or the surrounding of the tooth. But I'm really talking about bacterial infection into the tooth, into the jaw, out of the jaw. And really, I would have to say to you that source control is everything. This is a classic patient. Sorry, I might get you to not take the photo if that's all right. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but <laughs> the patients give permission for their uh, photos to be shown, but probably not to be, um, not to be recorded. Uh, and source control is everything. So drain the abscess, remove the tooth. So what about our old friends, the numerator and the denominator? Sorry to stumble through that. Uh, we knew about that for our previous study. And this, the denominator is quite easy. The presence of teeth at birth, it's not exactly 100%. You can get anodontia, but it's extremely rare. Uh, so nearly everyone has teeth. There's about 5 million people in Queensland. Not all of us are dentate. Some of us are edentulous, so they don't have teeth. Uh, but bacterial related tooth damage, by that I mean a filling, uh, is almost universal throughout lifetime. There's not many people who don't have a filling by the time they get into their old age. And tooth loss is almost 100% throughout the lifetime. Not all but bacterially related, of course. You can get trauma and orthodontic therapy and various other things that cause you to lose teeth. But most of these people don't need antibiotics or hospital treatment. Most of them require preventative dental care, restorations, periodontal therapy or, or extractions. Um, so we did a study in this hospital because really prompted actually by the incidence of ICU use. That was the question that we were predominantly interested in because anecdotally as a person who's been here for a long time as a trainee and a consultant, I noticed that more and more people with dental abscesses were ending up in intensive care. Uh, and that's kind of a side story to all of this, but it, um, we got a lot of data about dental abscesses as well. And again, in acknowledgements, Ben Fu uh, is the principal author on this study. It's part of his uh, master's degree. So we looked at two 24 month periods, a decade apart, all admissions and operations for odontogenic infections. And when you're thinking about odontogenic infections, this is the tip of the iceberg. So if you end up in a tertiary hospital with a dental abscess, you're not one of the people that's gone to see your dentist with a bad tooth had it extracted. These are people that ended up in hospital with an abscess that needed a, an operation. Um, we looked at all of these kind of things, demographics, sorry about the spelling mistake, prior history, antimicrobial therapy, imaging and treatment outcome, and what do we do well? Well, we were pretty good. 91% of, of prescribers adhered to the therapeutic guidelines in 2003 and four, and that went up. As I said before, most of these things aren't resistant bacteria. So 98.5% of the percent of the isolates or swabs, and probably 70 to 80% of these people had a, a swab in contrast to your uh, group and the veterinary group. So if you have your abscess drained in a hospital, someone's gonna take a pus swab most of the time, which is probably what you'd expect. Uh, and there were no deaths in either cohort. So nearly 300 people, uh, whereas this is a condition that used to have a mortality of about 50%. So we're doing fairly well on that uh, front. That's a mouthful of pus, by the way, just in case you weren't sure. So what did not improve? Well, the admission rate nearly doubled over the decade and the population in Queensland in that time went up by 22%. So more people are coming into the hospital with a dental abscess 
the delay to theatre or source control went up. So from 11 to 15.4 hours, they stayed in hospital longer and the ICU admission rate went from 7% uh, in 2003-04 to nearly 24%. And, you know, this week is a snapshot I walked around. We had three dental abscesses. One of them was in ICU. So it, it's not stopped since 13-14. This is, continues. Uh, and the increase in ICU admission rate alone costs uh, $700,000. So clearly at the hospital level, there is some work to do. We are not doing things well here for various reasons, which I won't go into in this talk. That's a separate kind of issue. But... What about pre-hospital care? Because actually stopping these people getting to hospital with dental abscesses is the most cost-effective and antimicrobial sparing approach. And this is probably the, the kicker. 63% uh, of the patients in our study were prescribed oral antibiotics by their general medical practitioner or dental practitioner in the days leading up to admission without removal of the offending tooth or without source control. So nearly two thirds of these patients were given a prescription. Uh, and patients frequently said they were given a prescription to anti for antibiotics and told to return uh, some days later when the swelling had resolved as the infection would make the local anaesthetic ineffective, which, you know, unfortunately is a mantra that is present in the community, certainly not exclusively. There are lots of good dental practitioners, but that is a, a very, very common myth. Uh, and I can see some of the dental practitioners in the audience nodding their heads because they know it to be true. And we had people come in all the time saying, I went to see my dentist, he said, go and take the antibiotics for a week and then come back when your swelling's gone and I'll remove your tooth. And they end up in the hospital and the swelling is worse. And a third of them end up in intensive care. So we have a problem. Uh, more people are coming in. They are very resource intensive, as you can see, and they're often treated uh, with antibiotics for weeks because by the time you've had your week of antibiotics and it hasn't worked, You've come into hospital and had your abscess drained and then you get your week of antibiotics to continue to treat you. You've been on it for two, sometimes three weeks. Uh, and our management of these patients has become more complicated, but if we look at things like length of stay, mortality, it's not better. So how do we fix it? Um, well, it's much harder to solve than our initial problem. And this is not to blame uh, the dental community, but it's a less coherent group of people to try and change behavior on. So educate, this is probably the hardest, I think. So educating existing practitioners about the limitations of antibiotic therapy and the use of local anaesthetic and the importance of source control. So getting that message out in the general dental and medical community, I have to say, is probably the hardest thing. This is something that uh, we as oral and maxillofacial surgeons and, and dental educators can contribute to so we can at least ensure that the next generation of dental practitioners don't believe that and will practice source control rather than antibiotics and return. Uh, access to treatment is obviously a very big uh, issue in dentistry. And I don't, I don't have any data on this, but I, and I have to say it's a bit anecdotal, but when I see patients who complain about access to dental treatment, it's usually the elderly and the uh, self-funded retirees who are complaining about being unable to access dental treatment. And these patients are not necessarily the same group. These tend to be young adult people who I'm not sure would access dental treatment if it was available. So maybe uh, Prof Lippmann's not in the audience, so I can say this. We take the $700,000 from ICU and we spend it on seven dentists to roam the state removing bad teeth. But there are other things that can help as well. Water fluoridation, of course, prevents dental caries in the first instance, or at least reduces its incidence. Uh, or a sugar tax. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. It's uh, nice to see the same messages of uh, never let the sunset on pus uh, coming through in a multidisciplinary way.